Greetings, everyone. My name's Wendy Gill. It's my pleasure to be your facilitator and be with you today. I'm the Mixed Farming Officer based at Forbes for the Ag Services team. Welcome to the second webinar and final webinar for the annual Temporary Pastures webinar series. This is where I get to delve into and have a chat to our guest presenter about manipulating pastures for improving productivity in your business. This webinar series is being brought to you as part of the Central West Ag Services Team ADAPT project, which is funded through the National Australian Government's National Land Care Program. Let's take a quick review of how to use the platform for all participants today. On the right hand side of your screen, you will see your control panel. You can use the orange arrow to collapse or expand this control panel at any time during today's presentation. At any time, if you need audio assistance, please give myself a call on the number below in the blue box. Today's presentation, every participant will be muted and we will be recording this webinar for future use as a resource. As a special note to the audience, both Belinda and myself will not be using our webcams today. This is to improve your audience audio experience for our discussions today. Feel free to submit questions at any time during the presentation in the text audio box down the bottom of your control panel. I thank, thank the audience for sending in all your pre-registration questions rather. They have been most useful to help establish today's presentation. So I'm curious to really find out who in our audience is joining us live today. So let's capture a snapshot. So we'll go to a poll. Now I'm going to launch this poll. This is, so the first question is being launched now and I'll Appreciate if all the audience could please click on the answers most or best represents your situation today. So we're just that polls open and we've got some early voters in, so that's great. Everybody's being really quick up on the polling today, so that's really good. I'll give it five more seconds. So we've got five, four, three, two. One, we've had great response to that and I'll just close that poll now and share that with everybody. So we've got 50% today are owner producers and we've got about 40% of industry advisors as well, both in the private. We've also got some private uh, industry advisors as well. So welcome aboard and um, thank you very much for joining us all today. I'll just also now launch our second poll question, which is based on enterprise type. So that's now open. If everybody would like to respond to their most correct answer that suits themselves. Again, we've got some early starters going, so that's great. It's quite even at the moment, so. I'll give it five more seconds. So five, four, three, two, one. And I'll close that poll and share that with you as well. Great, so we've got a really good proportion of our mixed farming enterprise joining us today and some equal numbers of livestock cropping enterprises and pasture livestock, as well as some Good to see some fodder pasture only um, audience participants with us today as well. So that's that's fantastic. So thank you very much for your participation in that. Uh, it really does give both myself and our guest presenter a really good snapshot. And it also means uh, in lieu of not having everybody join and, and turn on their webcams, we, uh, we get to really be able to engage with you uh, today in our discussions. So thank you very much for that. I'd, I'd like to warmly welcome our guest presenter, Dr. Belinda Hackney, who's joining us today again for our second, second webinar of this series. So for those of you who haven't been introduced to 
Belinda. Dr. Belinda Hackney is a research officer in the SOARS unit with New South Wales Department of Primary Industries. Belinda has greater than 20 years experience in research focusing on pastures, soils, and the integration of pastures in cropping systems. She's worked extensively with producers across the Central West and Southern regions of New South Wales, and in many national research projects. Belinda is a specialist in hard seeded annual temperate legumes, and she has an extensive portfolio of pasture research, which is highlighted on your screen now. I'm absolutely delighted and thrilled to have Belinda with us today, and I'm really looking forward to her presentation. So I'll hand over to Belinda now, and we'll start Belinda's presentation. I welcome Belinda and say hello to you, Belinda, and thanks very much for joining us. Thanks, Wendy, um, and thanks for the opportunity. I'm just waiting for this um, presentation to go up on slideshow mode. It's just taking its time. Um, but yeah, this will be, I guess, you know, last week we covered um, pasture renovation. Um, this week we'll be having more of a look at um, how you manipulate pastures that you may already have, um, which is often a, a much bigger proportion of the total pasture area that you're working with. Um, so here we go, we're up and away. Um, okay, there we so. Go. Yeah, we've got full, full load, Belinda. Good, great. Okay, so um, yeah, I guess, you know, this is just going back and looking at the kind of options that you have with pastures um, and, you know, there's either end of the extreme and the right hand side, if you're in a position where you're just maintaining pastures kind of at or near that maximum, that's a great place to be. Um, and hopefully you're not on the left hand side of the um, screen because that doesn't get very far. And most of us sort of end up in the middle. We're either thinking about renovating pastures that we already have or manipulating ones that um, could be doing a little bit better. So yeah, as I, as I said, and as Wendy said, today is more about the manipulation component. And this is pretty broad brush because there are so many manipulation tactics um, that you can look at with pastures. Um, I've just kind of narrowed in on a few and Wendy sent through some of those um, pre-webinar questions. Uh, so, you know, there's things like saffron thistle and that kind of thing that um, came up as quite topical in there. So we've, I've put in um, some specific information on those kind of things. So in terms of manipulation, you know, there's the, these, these two key kind of points that you have to think about. So identification of, of what you have in your pastures um, and what capacity you may have to change them. And then also how you prioritise what you do. And then it's a case of choosing um, tactics and, and we're really thinking about the first point under, under that in terms of altering what you already have there, whereas renovation is changing what you already have. So um, yeah, so they're kind of the two, I guess, principles of, of what we'll talk about as we roll through this. And on this manipulation side of things, the, the main things, um, you know, I want to talk about are, uh, we'll touch on some grazing things. There weren't perhaps quite as many questions on grazing. There was quite a lot on herbicides. Um, there's always questions on introducing um, other species into existing stands. Uh, and then there's, you know, occasionally nutrient availability also um, crops its head up. So they're the main kind of things that we'll talk about today. So in terms of manipulation of existing pastures, I would say the most common question that I have is, that the current pasture that you have, the favourable species within that pasture are not dense enough. Um, and the, the question is, you know, how do I improve the density of the favourable components of that pasture without having to go to full renovation? Um, and I think the first thing you have to consider with that is that you, you have to have a reasonable starting density in order to be able to manipulate it in a reasonable time frame. And then you've also got to appreciate that species vary in their response to manipulation. So we'll have a little bit of a look at that. So if we're thinking about um, some of the grasses, um, so Phalaris is a notoriously poor recruiter. Uh, and a lot of that is tied to um, ant theft of the seed. So the seed is kind of what's referred to as a naked seed. It's not really contained in a husk when it's shed by the 
by the plant. Um, and it's very easy for ants to pick up and, and um, steal. And Malcolm Campbell and others uh, have done beautiful work in the past, um, you know, showing very high, you know, more than more than 50%, sometimes more than 70% um, theft of that seed by ants in a 24 hour period um, from when it's shed by the plant. So it tends to be quite a poor recruiter and you get increases in density of filaris in a pasture primarily through an increase in plant size. So you have to manage that in terms of grazing um, to increase plant size. So that means resting it um, when it's forming dormant tillers and, and that kind of thing to allow that plant to increase in size. On the flip side of that is you have something like coxfoot, which is a very good recruiter um, and it can increase in density due to an increase in plant number. So it, there's still a degree of ant theft that happens with, um, with seed that's shed by coxfoot plants, but nowhere near what you get with filaris. And that's because that seed is contained in a quite, um, uh, you know, quite robust kind of husk. Uh, and so it's not as attractive to them. So in terms of um, manipulating that through grazing, uh, if you can rest that at a time when it's producing seed and then rest it again at a time when those seedlings are um, coming through, so usually you know, autumn, um, that kind of thing, then that will increase the density of those. If we're talking about native grasses, then they vary uh, in terms of recruitment too. So the wallaby grasses, Danthonias, tend to be quite good recruiters. Um, microlina, if you're on the high tablelands, is basically a vegetative increase um, in size, so extremely grazing tolerant grass uh, and spreads by rhizomes and stolons. And then you have, you know, at the other end of the spectrum, something like kangaroo grass, which is quite a poor recruiter. Now, the opposite can also happen and might be happening in, or is happening in some pastures this year, is where you've got quite a high density of some of these perennial grasses and it's crowding out. Um, other things, so particularly uh, legumes that are trying to come through and that kind of thing. So um, while you can't do it in all in all paddocks in all years, um, it's a case of, again, this prioritisation with your paddocks and utilising grazing to open up that canopy. And if you want to look at decreasing density further over time, then you would look at either not allowing seed set um, or if it's a filaris or something like that, grazing it hard at the time when it's going to be forming um, uh, dormant buds to prevent that increase in size. So in terms of legumes, um, as I said, um, you know, moving on from the grass thing, the, the real requirement for those is space, light and moisture. And we'll talk more about that later on. So the key to getting regeneration for those is to open up the canopy in late summer and autumn so that you get germination. And that Again, um, while the goal, you know, I'm not saying totally um, ditch the goals of high levels of ground cover, there's just basic principles of biology that come into play. And occasionally, if you want to maintain those species in the pasture, you have to open that up. So that means creating some bare ground for those to come through. But again, as I said, it's not a case of doing every paddock every year. It's a case of being strategic and doing some paddocks in most years in terms of. Um, managing that canopy and managing ground cover um, in autumn. Um, around seed set now, there's, to some degree, you do need to rest them um, to allow seed set in terms of not flogging them completely. But most of the um, legumes that we work with, so, you know, sub clover um, and a lot of the aerial seeding, like the hard seeded legumes, once you've actually got a seed bank of those there, they're, they're very, um, they're actually much more tolerant of grazing than people think. Um, so, you know, for sure, if you're wanting to increase the density, let them run through and, and be a little bit lenient on the grazing. But that doesn't mean not graze them at all, because if you do run into a wet spring and those kind of things, you can have disease issues come up if you've got a very dense canopy there. So it's, it's that kind of middle of the road thing again. And also remember with legumes, phosphorus, sulfur and molybdenum um, are really important in, in supporting legume growth and, and function in terms of nitrogen fixation. So um, we can talk more about that more specifically later. So in terms of other tactics for manipulation, um, so herbicides, uh, 
different options there. So <clears throat> spray grazing with some of the broadleaf um, weeds, so cape weed, paddo, um, some of the thistles and that kind of thing can be you know, really quite useful. So sublethal doses of, of products like MCPA or 2,4-D um, and then crash grazing those seven to 10 days later to um, remove the, the growing point. Uh, and that can be highly, you know, really very effective, can be quite difficult to achieve in a year like this when you come in out of drought and your stock numbers are low. Um, but again, it's that case of targeting that kind of thing to the right paddocks, so smaller paddocks where you can actually pile the stock on there and, and have an impact on those broad leaves. And sheep obviously will be better than cattle um, with that because of their capacity to graze lower and really take out the growing point of some of those rosettes. Um, lethal dose selective herbicides, we'll talk more about some of those specifically in relation to some of the weeds we're seeing this year in a little while, but um, you know, opening up the canopy is, is a bit of an issue perhaps this year, depending on, on what kind of stock you've got. And again, this is where you just have to prioritise perhaps which paddocks you can, you can feasibly do that in this year, but you need that open canopy so you get enough of the um, product onto the target plant. The other thing about grazing too is that it can be helpful in terms of minimising damage to um, the favourable um, species in the pasture. So you're, you're reducing leaf, leaf area on those if you graze ahead of spraying. So there's less capacity for those favourable species to take up um, the herbicide that's applied. So that can be a really useful strategy in terms of minimising damage. And then spray topping, we'll talk about that as well. Timing is really critical for that and more so if you're using glyphosate just because of the time it takes for glyphosate to move through the plant um, and have an impact. And we'll have a little touch on non-selectives used selectively as well and how that might be um, topical for this year uh, as we go through. So, um, We've sort of touched on the pre-spray things around um, grazing plus herbicides there um, in terms of using it prior to application of selectives, but post-spraying post it can be useful too to clean up um, the weed carcass uh, and also encouraging, encouraging tillering in some of the uh, grass species in particular. So, you know, it has a, grazing has a role to play in combination with herbicides in, that, in um, the use of some of these selectives. I suppose the other thing to think about too is um, again timing um, of, of herbicide application. So you want to be getting plants when they're actively growing. So avoid conditions generally where it's too wet or too cold or too hot or too dry um, because under those conditions you'll either have um, you know, poor uh, uptake or, or poor action um, of the herbicides on those target weeds. So um, make sure the thing's actively growing, that the plant that you're targeting um, is not particularly stressed uh, and, you know, obviously you get better action then. In terms of moisture, for some of the herbicides that you may be contemplating using this year, um, moisture is important for activation of them. So, you know, for example, if you're chasing Volpia, um, in some of your pastures with simazine or something like that, um, then you know when you get to that that time in winter where you're thinking of applying um, herbicides like that, make sure you actually have enough moisture there for for that uh, herbicide to do its job. On the flip side of that, if it's very wet, um, then you can get leaching um, of some of the actives with some of the herbicides, so leaching beyond the root zone. Um, with some of those chemicals, particularly slow uptake chemicals uh, before they, they actually get a chance to get into the plant. So, you know, it's all, all of this stuff is just very middle of the road. Make sure it's, um, you know, make sure the plant's actively growing and you've got adequate moisture, good temperatures, that kind of thing as far as possible. Now, you can't always get everything perfect, but try and at least get most of the ducks in a row. Okay, so um, moving on to, I guess, some of the um, broadleaf weeds that you might be contemplating um, controlling this year. And one of the questions that came through was, what kind of impact uh, do they have on clovers? Um, so I just pulled some of this data out this year. This first lot that we're looking at is, um, you know, 
the, the be a fair bit of MCPA used this year uh, in terms of chasing things like saffron thistles and and some of the other um, you know common suspects. Uh, so MCPA in combination with something else for Cape weed or um, Patterson's curse and those kind of things. So this was some work done um, a few years ago. Now it was looking at uh, MCPA applied at um, 500 grams of active ingredient per hectare on sub clover um, and applied six weeks prior to flowering. So there was a whole range of, um, of subterranean clover cultivars that were in this. I've just chosen two that are still um, you know, very widely used. There's been a lot of new ones come on the market since then, but Dalkeith and Seaton Park seem to just keep keeping on um, in terms of the sub clovers. So if we look at that graph in the top left-hand corner, um, that looks at, so. The herbicides were applied six weeks prior to flowering with these. So basically you're looking at um, somewhere, depending on the maturity of these things, an early to mid winter kind of spray. Uh, and you can see there on the left hand side, we're looking at what was the herbage yield then when these things got to full flower. And you've got the control in blue, which received no herbicide and you've got the MCPA um, treated, uh, treated plots. And you can see there that um, the MCPA application has actually resulted in an increase in uh, herbage yield at that time. And that's primarily driven by a reduction in competition um, from you know, other, other species that may have been in the sward. So while you might get, <clears throat> you know, in a lot of cases, you might get a short-term correction uh, in growth when you do apply a herbicide, their capacity to recover with something like MCPA, which you know will be out there quite a bit this year, is quite good. But you've got to think, of course, about other companion herbicides that might be going in there and what impact they might have. Then if we look down on the bottom right, again, you can see here, we're talking about seed yield this time. And so you can see with Dalkeith, when you're applying MCPA six weeks prior to flowering, really no difference in the amount of seed that was produced. So it's not, it's not causing um, terrible damage um, to that uh, and there was actually no significant difference with the Seaton Park either. Now it looks like a bigger difference there with the you know stimulatory effects of the MCPA but statistically um, really no difference there. So you know that's um, I guess people often worry about um, this and can be sometimes overly concerned about it but for you know some of the situations that we're all in this year um, particularly chasing saffrons and things like that um, that can give you a bit of confidence that, you know, um, it's better to roll the dice, I think, in, in these cases um, and have a crack at them early where you can. Follow up with something else later if you don't get a, um, you know, a, a really high um, kind of control on those problem things. But hitting them early in the season is definitely preferable. So if we go on and have a look at... Um, I just picked some stuff up this morning with the annual medics. So this was some stuff done by Rick Young out at Condoblin back in the early 90s. And same kind of thing, but here we're looking at 2,4-DB applied at a pretty healthy rate, um, 2.8 litres per hectare. It's going to hurt the wallet a little bit, um, but you know, one of the good options for chasing thistles and things in, in some of these um, medic type pastures. And he also had sub clover in there and, and had a look at that as well. So you can see, Again, they were now this was applied small seedlings, so somewhere between um, quickly looking at his paper this morning, sort of two to five leaf. Um, and you can see there on the top left, we're looking at herbage production uh, and um, some variation there in terms of how those different species of, of medic um, responded uh, to 2,4-DB application. So you can see that the gemalong, um, was really not affected by it. Um, a, a reduction, but not statistically significant for something like Harbinger. Um, and then the Burr medics were, um, you know, there was probably what we're looking at there, about a 1.5 tonne reduction in herbage biomass and, and not a significant reduction in the subclover with it either. Um, so, you know, on balance, if, if you're looking down the barrel of a heavy broadleaf weed, infestation in this and the weeds are still small enough for 2,4 dB to have some action, um, then really it's, again, it's probably something worth looking at. 
And if we look down on the bottom left, um, you can see seed yield there with those again. So again, it was really the Burmetic, so the Metacargo polymorpha um, on that graph, which showed the greatest reduction in seed yield. But in saying that, you're still looking at 800 kilos of seed per hectare produced, which is ample. That is a huge um, uh, seed set on a medic. So um, while there's a statistically significant reduction, um, practically you're not shooting yourself in the foot in terms of having a strong seed bank for future regeneration with, um, with the use of 2,4-DB at that rate and at that time. Okay, so moving on to spray topping. Um, so obviously, you know, the earlier in the season you can go with your selectives, the better. Um, but if for whatever reason, you know, you can't get around all the paddocks at that time or you have some you know, less than optimal results with your early spraying and spray topping um, is obviously something that can come into the mix and useful for both grass weeds and um, broad leaves. So if we have a look here at the top left one again, looking at um, the effect of uh, spray topping um, on annual ryegrass, barley or volpia um, in terms of impact on seedling number in the following year, you can see that except for that second volpia on the graph, um, you're well below 5% um, in terms of the number of seedlings emerging following spray topping compared to the unsprayed control. Now, volpia is a bit of a funny thing. There's different species of volpia, um, and uh, I think it's volpia myuros doesn't emerge, the head doesn't emerge fully from the sheath. Um, and so it tends to be one that's less impacted by um, spray topping than volpia bromoides, which is the more common one that we deal with. But again, still relatively effective in reducing numbers in the following year. Now with saffron thistle, um, of course, spray topping can be extremely effective with it. Um, and you can see there, the stage of growth uh, really impacts um, what kind of effect that, help, that has on, on seed production. So this is a percentage of seed produced compared to the unsprayed control. So getting them early when you've got um, just the green buds on them, uh, an application of paraquat at that stage, again, you, you're back to, um, or you basically reduce your uh, your seed production on those by more than 95%. So, um, and even at, at first flower, if you're spraying at first flower, you're still around 90% reduction. If you get beyond that, um, then the effect starts to, you know, wane. So again, timing is important with that. Um, so that's something to consider. But again, think about think about opportunities to get them early as rosettes if you can. Uh, and then this is a this is kind of a salvage operation, but can be very effective. But again, get the timing right. Now, in terms of um, saffron thistles and persistence of seed in the seed bank, um, did a little bit of scratching around this morning and had a look at that. Um, and it is it is something that can be quite dormant. So Pretty much you're looking at somewhere between 10 and 20% of seed that say, say seed gets through and is formed this year, around 10 to 20% of that seed will germinate next year uh, and around 30% then in the following year. Uh, and from that point on, it kind of diminishes because you get seed theft and, and rotting and those sorts of things. But yeah, it's, it's well worth um, chasing it. And, you know, if you, might, you may get a small penalty, you may not um, from that other, you know, the previous graphs we looked at in terms of herbage production on your legumes and seed set, um, the, you know, there's, there's the possibility of some reductions, but in some cases that it's actually stimulatory to them because it takes away that competition. Um, but yeah, in terms of, of preventing seed set and preventing future headaches, it's well worth uh, having a crack at them. Okay, so um, now if we have a look at spray topping impacts on uh, legume seed production. Um, again, some work that was done a while ago now, but really um, good work. This was out of Western Australia. Uh, and the top left graph, we're looking at seed yield um, for subclover for uh, either paraquat or glyphosate at a couple of different rates. 
and the the paraquat and glyphosate was applied at three different times so the blue bars and i should say for the control the controls are the same throughout so i didn't put three control bars up because they're all the same but the blue bars when we're talking about the paraquat glyphosate and glyphosate treatments um, was either applied when the subclover was at 22 percent flower at 53 percent flower or at 94 percent flower so basically spanning that range of um, quite early in the reproductive phase through to very late in the reproductive phase. So what you can see with that is there's been variation there in terms of um, the absolute impact that those herbicides have had on the yield achieved, um, but then also differences between the herbicides in the timing. So um, kind of universally, if you just cast your eye across that, if you're applying them kind of midway through that reproductive phase, that's been really quite damaging for all of those. All, all of those herbicides have been very damaging when they're applied halfway through that kind of flowering phase. And I guess that's because you, you, you know, the, the chance there that you're aborting um, a lot of uh, a lot of those flowers, and they don't actually go through to produce seed. Very early on, there's that chance if you're applying it very early on around that 22% kind of phase, particularly with paraquat, um, you're looking at greater potential recovery. So they get burned off, but there's more to come through later on. Uh, and then if you're applying it very late, then some of that early seed is kind of well into being formed and that kind of thing. So you have less potential impact on um, seed yield. And if we look at seed size, which is down on the bottom right hand side, you can see less impact um, of those herbicides and the timings on seed size compared to uh, the control. So um, the damage really, where, where you do get damage, it really comes about through um, uh, the impact on seed yield. Now, the other interesting thing to look at too, is what impact that has, or those herbicides and the timing of their application has on hard seed content, because this has the potential to affect, um, I guess, the proportion of seed, if you're talking about subclover, the proportion of seed that might be at increased risk of coming up on a false break. Uh, and then also longer term, the impact on um, the longevity of the seed bank. So if we have a look at that, the top, um, left is looking at what kind of hard seed levels you have in seed that's been formed um, in the year prior if you look at that that seed in January. So it's extracted from the paddock in January and what's the hard seed content. So you can see there with paraquat didn't really matter that much um, when it was applied in the year prior it was really in January it really wasn't significantly different to the unsprayed control in terms of hard seed levels. But when you get onto um, glyphosate, uh, you can see there that it's generally more, uh, or has a greater impact. So you have a higher proportion of softer seed in the population. So, you know, some interesting results there in terms of, I guess, the, um, the impact that has on capacity of the, of the seed to fully form that hard seed coat um, between the different herbicides. And you can see then if you have a look at the hard seed content in April, so they've went back into the paddock in April and extracted more burrs and had a look at what the hard seed content of those ones were. And again, you can see with the paraquat, really no difference um, between the paraquat and the unsprayed control. But with the glyphosate, you've had a significant reduction in hard seed content. So again, the glyphosate treated ones are potentially going to be at a higher risk um, of coming up very early in the season, which is fine if you get a, a soft autumn. But if you have a you know stop-start kind of um, event in at the at the beginning of the growing season, then potentially with those shallow rooted species like subclovers, um, you're at much higher risk of of seedling mortality with those. So again, um, you know, I, to me, it's something where um, I guess this is where you weigh up the, the or, or you look at the balance um, in terms of the benefit of controlling that weed um, compared to letting it go through. And even with glyphosate, I, you know, yeah, it's, you'd be coming down on the side of control every time. So, I mean, paraquat, if you can, 
um, in terms of being less damaging to hard seed content and potential longevity, um, but that wouldn't rule out the use of glyphosate in my book in any way, shape or form. Um, but of course, remembering with glyphosate, you have to be a little bit more timely with it because of the time that it takes to move through that weed and have an action on it. Okay, so moving on to non-selective herbicide use selectively. So um, I know some people um, are quite averse to weed wipers, but they're quite different beasts to what they were um, 30 or 40 years ago. And, you know, a lot of them used to drip terribly and it was really hard to control flow and that kind of thing. But there's um, you know, some, some quite innovative designs out there now uh, with some of these. And again, it can be something used later in the season um, to control either weeds that you didn't get to early in the season or weeds that have escaped control, um, other control methods early in the season. And they are quite an underutilised um, thing and they can be something that you use to sustain the life of selectives. So, um, you know, that can be quite useful given the amount of, um, you know, herbicide resistance that's around. And, and basically all you're doing with this is looking at exploiting those height differences and palatability differences with um, favourable compared to non-favourable weeds. So you can go simply on a height exploitation kind of thing where um, you, know, you just wait for those problem weeds to start to run up um, and hope that they end up higher than the canopy of the favourable species and go in with your wiper then. Um, and the other thing that you can do too is use, you know, use grazing um, to take down the height of the favourable species and then go in with your wiper. So you, again, you just, you just start to stack things in your favour in terms of not accidentally um, hitting some of those favourable species. But, you know, they, they can be quite effective. You can see there on the right hand side of your screen, um, that's an example with wild radish, um, the untreated uh, or seed production as a percentage of the untreated control um, where you uh, wiped it. Um, and that's, you know, proved quite effective. So, you know, you can look at using some quite concentrated herbicides that you would never dream of using um, in, a, in a more broad acre application sense. Okay, so moving on to the next thing, um, which is introduction of other species into established pastures. And I said earlier on, this is probably the most common question that I've got through my career. Um, and generally it, it comes around that people are wanting to put more legumes into either an established um, perennial grass pasture or an established lucerne pasture. And you've got those three key requirements for any plant really, um, but particularly when you're putting something into an already established stand where you need space, light and moisture for those things to get a toehold and have a chance of establishing. So you need to, if, if this is something you're contemplating, you need to have a really good think about um, site preparation in terms of ground cover. So having enough space, if you look down through a canopy and you can't see the ground, um, you know, the, the chances of, of um, getting something to establish in there are, are very slim. Uh, and in some cases, you may need to look at inhibiting um, some of that existing pasture just, just to hold it back. So, you know, a bit of chemical inhibition of um, existing pasture. Moisture availability is really important and that's not just at a point in time, that's over a continued time period, um, you know, to allow, um, the seed to take in enough moisture to germinate, but then also to allow enough time for the root to chase the moisture front down the profile and get it established. You also need to think about the method of introduction and then the rate of um, seed that you're using because you're, you're set up in an extremely um, hostile situation in terms of competition. Um, and like I said in last week's webinar, all of this comes down to a numbers game. Uh, at the end of the day. So um, it's not an impossible thing to achieve, um, but it is harder than when everything's starting um, from the same point. So um, this was some really nice work, I suppose, you know, and I suppose I should say here at the start of this one, is generally the most common way people try to get um, something into an already established stand is just to spread it on the surface. So it's often when you're running through and you're putting a bit of fertilizer out on the pastures and they'll throw some seed in there and, 
and um, kind of hope for the best. But it's, you know, it's, it's a high risk sport. Um, there's a lot of losses. And this was some work done by Malcolm Campbell um, back in the early 70s, uh, looking at, at losses basically from when the seed goes out in the paddock and its surface spread um, till you get root entry into the soil. So you can see there, if you, if you start out um, with your seed, you're at 100%, uh, then the ants come in. And it, again, with this, he's looked at it where seeds went out either in summer or winter. Um, and you can see basically, you know, look at that over time and, and see where that 100% of your seed goes. So you really get a very, very small percentage of it through less than 5% of that seed gets through um, to the point where you've got radical entry. And that was in the winter, um, you know, the, the winter spread seed, um, less than 1% with the summer um, spread seed. So it is um, very high risk um, and you do have potential to, to lose a large majority of the seed that goes out in that way. So this was some work um, uh, Sue Orgel and I did quite a few years ago now. I um, only got around to writing some of it up a couple of years ago, but looking again at different, um, different methods to get uh, seed into an already established pasture. And this was into uh, a native grass pasture. It was a stiper um, pasture. So one of those pastures that you look at and you see big bare gaps in between, um, in between the mature plants and you think, oh, well, I've got to have a, chance of getting pretty good establishment into that. So we had different treatments um, in that graph at the bottom. We either had surface broadcast on the left. Um, we had surface broadcast where we did a pre-spray. Um, we had direct drilling or we had direct drilling where we did um, a pre-spray uh, to just hold back that pasture prior to establishment. This was done um, at a couple of different positions in the paddock. So a north and south facing aspect and of course the north one more subject to um, drying down quicker and, and not being as favourable for germination. But the, I guess the real thing to come out of that is um, you really had to go direct drill with a pre-spray to just hold back some of that pasture. And you, you've got to be careful when you're using pre-sprays too, that you don't go too far and that you understand how, um, how the herbicides are going to interact on the different species and what their capacity for um, regeneration is and that kind of thing. So we got the best results where we went with a direct drill with a um, pre-spray uh, in getting subclover into that pasture. And interestingly, so that was back in, I think, for memory, 2005. Um, I had a look at that site a couple of years ago. Uh, and again, it was only in those treatments where we had, um, we still had clovers persisting with that. So you can see on that graph, we did a surface broadcast um, and you held back the pasture a little bit. Um, then, you know, you did get a better result, but you're still only talking, um, you know, much lower density compared to what we got where we direct drilled it. So it's, you know, really important to have that seed soil contact um, and a little bit of protection for, for that seed to germinate and, and start to get up and away and get its roots in uh, and get well settled in in those pastures. So this is just sort of showing um, those effects a little bit more. And this is looking at soil moisture um, and you've got uh, soil moisture as a percentage up the side um, and you've got two dotted lines running across there. So if we just look at the graph on the left for a start, the top dotted line that's running horizontally is um, field capacity and the bottom dotted line is permanent wilting point. So this um, was for um, moisture blocks that were buried at 10 centimetres. And so what you can see there is that the moisture content jumps around um, a lot and, and really quite quickly. So you need sustained periods where you're basically going to be above field capacity. So you have quite a lot of moisture there for um, those, you know, those, those seedlings to start to germinate. Uh, but what you can see, and this was done on the high, like high tablelands at about 750 metres. So you can see there, if you're putting um, seed out, say, if we look at that December, Sort of December to March and then March to June, um, so that 0102 period on that graph on the left, 
that's going to be kind of the window where in those areas you're looking at putting fertiliser out on pastures and where um, people would be also putting out um, seed. And you can see that there's just these massive shifts from very wet to very dry. And this is at 10 centimetres, so that shift is even more intense closer to the surface. And so the capacity for that little legume to take in enough moisture because it, you know, it needs a number of days um, with good moisture conditions to even start to initiate germination, let alone start to um, grow and get its roots into the soil in that period is going to be a very hard thing to achieve. Now you get into June and in those environments, that's when your moisture levels are high, but it's also when it's very, very cold. So you might get germination, but emergence is going to be extremely slow in those conditions. So by the time it actually gets up and away, um, it's, it's, you know, getting into spring and the resident um, herbage there is, you know, really ready to go. It's got its roots down. It's really ready to go. It's a very hard thing to do. Now, the graph on the right is just a different position in that paddock. So we have one on the north, one on the south. Uh, and you can see, I guess, with, it, with that, that the conditions are generally more benign um, in those environments. And this kind of stuff is translatable to some extent to um, mixed farming areas. You're going to get that variation. Um, the timing of when you have adequate moisture is going to shift slightly. The one thing you have in your favour in, in the mixed farming zone is that your temperatures will be higher than what they were in these experiments. But um, it's still quite a difficult situation because you've got that competition between the established pasture and the, you know, the thing that you're trying to introduce. Um, and this is uh, some work that Brian Deere did um, a few years ago. So getting closer to your kind of environment um, where a lot of you are probably listening. Um, this was done at Wagga, so mixed farming zone. Um, milder winters, uh, that kind of thing. It was looking at how well annual legumes regenerate in a perennial pasture um, and comparing that to a, a subclover monoculture. So they looked at um, the number of seedlings that emerged on summer rainfall um, and you had a higher proportion in the loosened subclover pasture and we can have some discussion um, later about the effects of moisture stress on hard seed coat formation. Um, that's probably, you know, one of the explanations for why you've got a higher percentage in the, in the loosen um, treatment. Uh, and then you've got the um, number of seedlings emerging uh, on autumn rainfall, and that didn't really differ between the treatments, but there was a big range. The interesting thing to look at though, are the bottom two rows in that um, table, where you're looking at seedling size in that first row, and the, this is relative um, for seedling size relative to the subclover monoculture. So this, the subclover seedlings, when they're coming up in either a perennial grass or a loosen um, pasture, at the same point in time when the sampling was done were only half the size of the subclover monoculture. So again, that speaks to how well their roots are down. What's above ground is a pretty good reflection of what's below ground. So their capacity to compete and harvest nutrients and harvest moisture. And that flows onto the next line where they're looking at relative water content. And that's just an indication basically of, I guess for, you know, in its simplest terms, how wilted is your plant? Um, and so you can see um, the relative water content on the subclover monocultures is up around 75%. So, you know, they're nice, healthy plants, not particularly moisture stressed, but at the same point in time, the subclover on or coming up in the perennial grass or in the lucerne um, only had 30% moisture in it. So it's a big competition thing for these things to be able to come in. And that's where, you know, you can you can do things to open up canopies and, and um, that kind of thing with grazing to just give these things a better chance. So it can be a hard um, thing to achieve that balance going over time. And like I said, you know, throughout this, it's not that you're going to do every paddock every year, but probably do some paddocks in all the years in terms of just managing that burden um, of what these things have got to come up against to, to achieve a better balance. All right, so we're in the home straight and Wendy's just sent me a text to tell me to get a wriggle on, so I will. Um, so the last thing I really wanted to talk about was nutrient availability, because that's one of the low hanging branches in terms of um, capacity to manipulate pastures. So. Um, 
if we talk first about phosphorus, so this is the kind of table that um, a lot of you would have seen before. And your phosphorus, the, the kind of critical phosphorus level, which is sort of a poor name for it because it's, it's kind of like your target phosphorus level would be a better term. So that's on the right hand side of that table. Um, and then on the left hand side of the table is the phosphorus buffering index, which is basically an indication of, of how, um, how difficult, I guess, it is to change phosphorus levels in your soil. So the higher the number, um, the more fertiliser you have to put on to achieve that kind of um, target phosphorus level. Now, most of the soils um, that I guess we work with in, in a lot of the pasture areas through central and southern New South Wales, they'll fall into the PBI category of kind of very low to moderate. So you're looking at a target phosphorus level of somewhere around, you know, 30 to 40 generally with a lot of the soils that we work with. So in looking at your soil tests, have a look at what your um, phosphorus level came back at. So if it comes back, say, um, at, let's just say your phosphorus level comes back at um, 19, and then you look at your phosphorus buffering index, and it says you've got a phosphorus buffering index of 75, and your available phosphorus was 19, you zip across, so you're looking at 71 to 140 category, because that's where your phosphorus buffering index was, and your target phosphorus level for 95% um, of maximum production is 34, and you're sitting at 19, then it may be time to look at applying a bit of phosphorus. So in soil surveys that we've done um, through central and southern New South Wales in the, in the last sort of seven or eight years, um, generally phosphorus levels have been pretty good. Um, so we've been looking at, I guess, from memory, 70% or more of paddocks have been at or above the target phosphorus level based on their phosphorus buffering index. So while there are some paddocks out there that are deficient, um, most are travelling pretty well. Now, if you're at or above um, that target phosphorus level, the critical value um, in that table, then there's no um, benefit of putting more phosphorus on to try and increase production. So if you're in that fortunate situation where you're at or above that critical level, then have a look at what the next limiting factor might be. And it might be something like another nutrient, it might be soil acidity, um, you know, it could be those kind of things in terms of your soil um, chemical analysis, the next thing that you want to look at. But don't go applying really high luxury rates of, of phosphorus over and above what your critical level or target level for your soil is, um, because it's not going to be something that generates a huge increase in production for you. So the other one I just wanted to um, quickly talk about was sulphur. Um, so sulphur deficiency has been um, much more widespread in the surveys that we've done. Um, it's a much simpler beast in terms of determining what the critical or target value is. Uh, and it runs at eight milligrams per kilogram. So it's a very simple thing to look at on your soil test and decide whether you're at adequate or inadequate um, levels. So, you know, consider that one as well, have a look at that. Uh, the other thing, I didn't put a, um, a graph in, um, but in terms of legumes, molybdenum um, is an important um, micronutrient. So it's something that you need, particularly for legumes, for um, nitrogen fixation and for, uh, you know, good function within the nodules. So um, there's sort of defined areas where, MO deficiency is known uh, and in those areas you're looking at um, application of MO every four to five years um, to you know correct those deficiencies but it's something it's a micronutrient so a little bit is good which doesn't mean a lot is better um, and you don't want to get into the situation where you're supplying too much of it because you can run into copper deficiency with your livestock so um, and it's not something that you test for on a soil test because because it's a micronutrient, it's such tiny amounts. It's it's something um, you know that you you look at either in tissue tests uh, or one of the giveaways for it can be 
um, very poor nodulation in your legumes or the other thing that you can see too is um, you'll dig up your plant and you'll have like a long string of beads um, of nod like a long string of nodules that look like a string of beads and they're all white they're tiny and white so that can be an indication of it but please talk to your advisors um, around molybdenum deficiency because it's something that you don't want to over apply. It's important to have enough, but you don't want to have too much. All right, so in terms of manipulating pastures, the thing is you've got to have an exploitable difference there. So you've either got to be able to, um, you know, uh, have differences in, in how they'll respond to grazing, or differences in what kind of herbicides will give you um, or give an advantage to the uh, un to the favourable ones compared to the unfavourable ones and those kind of things. It's very hard to um, change something if you can't favour one thing over the other. You've got to have reasonable expectations. Um, the cost of manipulation a lot of times is a heck of a lot lower than um, renovation, um, but it's something that you really need to keep in mind. So, you know, really cost it and, and see what it is gonna cost you to, to um, undertake some of these things. And also remember your timelines must be um, realistic as well. So some of these things are more than one season to achieve and they'll usually, re um, usually require a combination of tactics rather than just one. So in summary, you know, it might, it might sound old hat, but sit down and work out what paddocks you've got and then prioritise, uh, you know, which ones are the most important to do something to. So you're better off to concentrate on a few and do them well um, rather than to try and do everything and not quite get there. And part of that prioritisation process is, is knowing what's in your paddocks and what the limitations of those paddocks are, whether it's a, a soil factor, pasture factor, your capacity to get around them, um, those sorts of things. And yeah, so that's, I guess that's the, some of these points that relate to um, last week's, which tells you I didn't look at the summary slide before I started this. Um, but again, timing is probably the most important thing in any of this. So most of these tactics we talked about today can either work really well or really badly. And a lot of it comes down to, you know, the timing of when they're implemented. So. I reckon I might pull up there, Wendy. Thanks very much, Belinda. That's, um, you've, I definitely know when I hear Belinda speak that she's um, always able to cover about 75% of any of the questions that are coming in at any one time. So, um, so I think across that presentation today, you've managed to hit on uh, a large majority of actually the questions that that were being posted and and then you've next thing you've entered them so that's um, been a fantastic way of, of moving through some information that that people are really seeking so um, it's been very insightful to actually hear this presentation today so now we're heading towards questions so um, I'd invite anybody that has any further questions to just type them in your text box there on your control panels and um, and we'll just um, give those a couple of minutes to come through. So um, for those participants today, I know we got you to engage really early in the poll questions. Uh, I'd also like to raise with you that there will be a five question quick survey at the end of this webinar. Uh, we'd really love that level of feedback from you all to hear uh, about what you thought of today's webinar. And it really does give us um, some important information to keep delivering events that add value to you and your business. So certainly encourage everybody to quickly do that survey when it launches straight after the end of this webinar. So we'll jump into the question and answer session with, um, with Belinda now. So um, I've got a question here, Belinda, we'll start with um, going back to the grazing components that you talked about early in your presentation. Um, in terms of opening that canopy up to allow those legumes to germinate, do you have any tips around grazing strategies or which grazing um, situation might, might be more preferential to not only maximise the germination of those annual legumes, but also to balance those animal health 
and production benefits, obviously, to ensure that you don't overgraze um, some of those pastures as well. What's your thoughts around, mm -hmm. is there a different strategy or of grazing that, that's probably more suited to managing and opening up that canopy? Yeah, look, I think, Wendy, the, the, the ideal situation with that kind of thing is the quicker you can get the grazing job done, the better it is for everything, um, pasture and livestock. So, you know, if, you, if your um, grazing intensity is too low, then they'll pick their way around things and, you know, they'll, they'll even if you put them in in, in um, summer and you think there's not much green there, they'll go through and they'll, like particularly sheep, they'll go through and they can be just so selective, it's ridiculous. Um, and they can actually spend a lot of time tiptoeing around and not doing the job at all. So you're far better off to, um, you know, have, have larger numbers for shorter periods. Um, and basically a crash graze is preferable if you can do it. Um, so it's short duration, high intensity, um, and there's less there's less opportunity for selectivity and there's more potential to actually make the animals open that canopy up rather than, you know, like fiddle around and, and just be really selective. So, you know, if you can do that, and I know it's hard, I know it's hard on the back of the drought because you don't necessarily have the numbers to do it. Um, but again, that comes down to the type of paddocks that you would select to do that in. So it might be a case if, you, if you're limited on numbers, you might have to target paddocks that are a smaller area in that year. Um, and in terms of the class of livestock that you use, uh, you know, <laughs> um, sort of mature animals tend to be better weed whackers than, than young ones um, and better at, at hoovering things. So, you know, um, crossbred ewes are kind of the ultimate in that kind of thing. Um, and sheep generally generally can do a bit better job than cattle, although in saying that, cattle are often good to, to put through to, you know, if, you, if you're talking tall, dense kind of stuff, they're good to put through as a first check to open things up. Uh, and then you can follow through with sheep later if you need to. But yeah, the, the shorter the duration, the, the, the quicker you can be in and out, generally the better you are for everyone. Great, that's, uh, that's really a very good information there in, in that answer. So we'll, um, we'll head back towards a couple of nutrient questions. Um, so I've got a question here around what pH should you expect to see uh, molybdenum deficiency in, in your pastures? Uh, <laughs> yes, um, good question. Um, so generally, it, it kind of follows the same principle as a lot of the macronutrients. So the more acidic you get, the less available it becomes. But it can vary a lot on what the paramaterial of the um, of the paddock has been and how much is, you know, how much is kind of in that as well. But generally, you know, um, I suppose I suppose a good way to answer this question is one of the things you don't do in terms of molybdenum application is don't lime and apply MO because what you'll find is when you increase it, and particularly when your pH comes up above five, in some cases you'll also make MO more available. So yeah, if if you if you are liming, don't lime and apply MO. Now the thing I would say to you as well is um, you have to think about the efficiency of use of all of it, all of your applied nutrients when you start to get in soils with a pH below five, because you know all efficiencies get on the slide, regardless of whether you're talking about legumes or grasses, because that's when you're kind of starting to get into that territory of it affecting root growth and capacity to harvest nutrients, and you've got root pruning and stuff going on. So it's all very well to say apply it if you're at a very low pH, but you've got to think about the efficiency of use of those kind of things as well. So not just the micronutrients, but also the macronutrients. So always better to be above five where you can. I know it's not always possible. Um, and, you know, yeah, sort of above five, you'll tend to have less issue with it, but you can still have problems with it. So it's not, I know that's a politician's answer, um, but it's not, it's not super cut and dried. No worries, that's great. I think um, that certainly gives our listeners some parameters to think about when they're when they're trying to um, you know definitely answer that uh, that that question. So 
Um, now, the other nutrient question we've got just coming through is if if a producer has a paddock that's at a look at their critical value for phosphorus, should they just continue to use maintenance rates? Well, um, again, that's a that's an it depends kind of question. Because um, I suppose what you've got to think about with all of this too is like balancing up your nutrient applications with your utilization strategies. So, you know, are you are you um, Utilize, like, are you in a position where you can utilize um, the feed that you're producing? Um, you know, that's a good question to ask yourself. So it's, and again, it depends on what your phosphorus buffering index too is. So the higher your phosphorus buffering index, the longer it takes for you to actually slide backwards in terms of what your phosphorus level will be. So if you're on a very, um, on a soil with a very low PBI, that shifts around up and down, like up with nutrient application or down without it much more quickly than if you're in kind of those mid range type of things. So they're the kind of questions that you've got to, all the kind of things that you've got to look at on your soil test results. So, you know, if, you, if you're at that lighter end um, in terms of phosphorus buffering index, then, you know, it's, those those soils will change in terms of nutrient availability much more quickly. I suppose the thing to think about too is it's a case of balancing up again, sitting down and looking across the board at all of the paddocks you've got, um, and looking at how many paddocks that you have in that situation and what their characteristics are. So it costs a lot of money to get them to that critical level. So to some degree you want to kind of keep them there and not let them slip too far back. But from the same by the same token, there's there'll be within any farm, there'll be a range of soils that you have that have different capacity in terms of how rapidly they move in nutrient availability, um, either when you're applying um, fertiliser or when you stop applying it in terms of how quickly it builds up and how quickly it can slip back. And then also how much you utilise in, so the livestock removal part of it also comes into that in terms of how quickly it'll change. So again, <laughs> Pretty much like all of this stuff, there's a few different components to consider in that. No worries. That's uh, definitely, definitely, I think, is wise words in terms of making sure everybody sits down and really has to think about and, and plans out what strategy they're trying to employ and what their end goal really is in terms of what they're trying to achieve in, in each of their paddocks. So um, now I've just got a couple of questions more focused around um, assessing feed on offer and um, heading towards a few differences of, of matching or managing their pastures with also the animal health potential, um, you know, impacts and that sort of stuff as well um, from different annual pastures. So I've got one here that says, um, what's the, looking for some advice on what's the best and easiest way to assess feed on offer and to create a grazing plan in somebody's, around somebody's pastures? Yep. Um, so um, I've got to say I'm still a cut and weigh person in terms of pasture assessment that I I still don't because you, I like I know people will go out and they'll do just a visual assessment on pastures in terms of feed on offer and that kind of thing. Um, I've just found over the years that, you know, humans are very easily fooled, myself included. Um, and it's it's one of those things, if you just take a cut from a known area, so a quadrat um, that you take out uh, and take a number of cuts over your paddock, um, dry them and weigh them. In terms of feed on offer, that's a, that is the best way to do it. It's, um, it takes a little bit longer than guessing it, um, but it's a whole lot more accurate. Uh, so yeah, in terms of feed on offer, that's, you know, that's what I would look at. Now, in terms of grazing strategies, well, that's going to depend very much. Again, that's a you know that's a that's a uh, hat full of points in terms of you know which one do you pull out and what's the most important. So, it's going to depend on the composition. Uh, it's going to depend on the time of year that you're looking at when you're looking at um, you know what's on offer and and what's there, and then what the relative tolerances are of the different species in the pasture to grazing at that time. So, 
in terms of your grazing plan, you've got to think about things like um, when do plants become reproductive and how susceptible are they to um, you know, negative impacts of grazing during that reproductive phase? Then what's your end goal with that paddock? So are you trying to increase the density or decrease the density? Um, so you know, if you're trying to increase the density of something, then you're going to go lighter on it uh, in terms of when it's in that reproductive phase um, to allow seed set in annuals, um, to allow seed set in some grasses or for some grasses to give it capacity to facilitate vegetative um, increases, whether that's through you know, dormant buds in phalaris or all that kind of thing. So there's, again, there's no, there's no straight answer on that. It's very much depends on the time of year that you're looking at it and what's in that pasture. And then also, then you've got to throw on top of that again, um, what classes of livestock are you considering and what's their needs in terms of digestibility and protein and those sorts of things. No worries, okay, all right. Now, um, just following on from that, I suppose, and you've touched just briefly on it in some of that answer there, but um, I've got another question here that's just um, looking for some some sort of highlighted discussion around some key livestock risks in terms of grazing on uh, annual, annual temperate pastures. Is there any, um, from some of the varieties that you regularly deal with, Belinda, is there any sort of, key livestock risks or, um, you know, uh, not so much disease, but risks around that producers need to be aware of um, just to manage in terms of some of these pasture varieties at certain stages, maybe throughout the season, that may impact in terms of on production, whether that's from eating lower quality or higher water, um, water content feed at certain times of the year. Is, is there some, something that stands out that producers should be really really aware of and looking for to manage and get ahead of that um, for, for different um, different certain types of uh, annual pastures that you see? Um, look, Wendy, I'll, I'll give you an agronomist perspective on that, but if you want a <laughs> more accurate assessment, I'd be talking to a livestock officer or a vet, but I'll give you a, a, an agronomist viewpoint on that. So I suppose in terms of um, annual legumes and but also you know bringing perennials into this so loosen and that kind of thing um, particularly in the clover medic um, type of lines the the most obvious one that that jumps out there um, from this time of year right through to when you get you know further into the reproductive stages of growth with them is bloat um, so you know any anything that that has trifolium in its name or medic in its name um, tends to be a higher bloat risk. Um, things like serradellas have uh, have moderate tannin contents in them, um, which help stop that frothing in the rumen, um, and you know, um, so a much safer uh, kind of, I guess, kind of options in terms of bloat. Uh, and Vicerula also um, tends to be a lower bloating um, species, and also has some very interesting characteristics in terms of fermentation. So it's a very low methane producer uh, as well. Now in saying that, um, within the clovers and the medics, and the medic, the medics include lucin, obviously, because it's a it's a metacargo as well. Um, you know, maturity is kind of the maturity and then um, mix or balance in the pasture is the kind of key thing to to managing bloat risk with those from from an agronomist perspective. Um, the the longer the longer you go through the growing season, and the more they get into more advanced stages of growth, and the annuals into reproductive growth, and that kind of thing, the lower the bloat risk that you have with those. Um, and then also, if you've got another component in the in the pasture, so a, a grass or something like that, that can that can help minimise um, you know the the incidence of that. I suppose the other thing with um, straight loosen pastures too uh, in sheep is red gut, um, which can be an issue. Uh, but again, that kind of comes down to um, you know, trying to balance up that diet a little bit better. So uh, where you've got other things in the pasture with it, you tend to have less incidence of that. Um, I guess on the flip side, uh, when you get into very strongly grass dominant pastures, you can have increased risks of grass tetany. Uh, and those kind of things. So, um, you know, that, that's the 
they're probably the key things that you start to look at. But um, and then you know when you get when you get super late into the season, um, oh, I suppose you know throughout the season, generally it's that trade-off between the, the overriding thing in all of this in terms of what drives your animal production is that trade-off in in quality and quantity. So, you know, um, a lot of us are in a fairly fortunate position this year in that there's there's um, quite a good body of feed around now and the quality is pretty reasonable, but often at this time of the year and moving into winter, you'll have, um, you know, you'll have, you'll have plants sitting there that are pretty high quality in terms of digestibility and protein, but, but your animal production is, is limited by the quantity that's available. And then you know, when you start to get into, um, into the later stages of reproductive growth, often you, your production potential is limited by quality more than quantity. So, um, and then through summer, often you're limited by both. So, you know, they're, they're, the, they're the main drivers, but, you know, if you want to get into the nitty gritty of, of um, animal disorders, yeah, you, you need a livestock person or a vet to, you know, discuss those things further. I think you've, um, I think you've definitely, highlighted and touched and answered that question remarkably well Belinda from an agronomic point of view and definitely I would encourage um, our listeners if they're after more information to to certainly speak to a livestock officer or a, or a district vet at any of their close, closest offices around um, around any concerns around animal production or, or livestock uh, livestock health so we might um, we've, we've moved through a, a great number questions and um, I am conscious of the time so we've we've covered all of our our um, audience questions today so I thank Belinda and the audience for staying online today and um, and persisting I know we are a little bit over time but I think those answers Belinda you've given us have been extremely valuable in in just understanding a few more nuances uh, around making sure we manipulate our pastures in the in the most uh, critical timing windows but also in the you know adjusting for those nutrients um, sort of critical elements as well and to get the best animal performance and production out of those uh, out of those pastures so um, now so I think we'll we'll move away and, um, and head for a wrap up there so thanks very much Belinda there um, so if you are looking to or need some further information Belinda's contact details are currently on the screen and just a reminder that I will be sharing with all registered participants um, from today's webinar the recording which you will receive tomorrow uh, via your emails uh, so if you'd like to review any components or catch up on on a section you might have might have accidentally missed today um, that will be available to you if you're also interested in catching up um, on last week's webinar that Belinda uh, came and had a chat to us about around getting newly established pastures um, up and going. Certainly you can find that recording on the Central West Local Land Services website. In terms of um, upcoming events that are available and happening around the district for the Ag Services team, i uh, just like to draw the audience attention to um, these events that are happening across uh, May and June um, and certainly encourage the audience that our events page on the Central West Local Land Services website is up to date and is a great reference point for any field days, workshops or um, training courses that, that will be run in the next period of time. So definitely jump on there and we hope you can join us as some of those events. So I'd like to thank Belinda for her time and sharing her knowledge today. And to all of our audience that, that have joined us today, I say thank you very much for your time. It's been an absolute pleasure to be hosting you today and to have this discussion, and I hope you've found it really valuable. So until next time, thank you very much, and we'll see you next time.